Okay, welcome to this lecture uh, on emotion for block 13. Um, we're not going to go into too much gritty detail on how emotion works. Uh, my goal for this lecture is to give you um, a good idea of what structures do what with emotion and in such a way that you can clinically apply your knowledge and it's the knowledge that will be clinically relevant to you in the long run. So this is from your study guide. Uh, basically, I need to teach you your structures involved in the um, in emotion, um, how emotion relates to consciousness and neurotransmitters involved. So the primary uh, centers, emotional centers of the brain, uh, are referred to as the limbic system, and the limbic system consists of three major components. Um, different textbooks and different experts also throw in some other components into the limbic system. So the limbic system is a bit of a wishy-washy um, definition, um, but generally people agree that these three structures are definitely part of the limbic system, and uh, at, uh, at, at the very least these are the three structures consisting of the uh, limbic system. So first up we have the cingulate gyrus, which you can only really see on a mid sagittal view of the brain. Hippocampus, which is deep in the temporal lobe, so it's part of the temporal lobe. Uh, you have to cut away the te temporal lobe to discover this little hippocampus structure lying deep t uh, inside it. And the amygdala, uh, which is just anterior to the hippocampus and um, is also part of the basal ganglia. Uh, so, part one of the um, components of the basal ganglia is the amygdala. One of the components of the limbic system is the amygdala. So in terms of the limbic system, amygdala plays a role more um, with emotions in general, whereas uh, in the basal ganglia, the amygdala plays a role in decision-making processes. But uh, emotion isn't uh, limited to these three structures. There are other structures in the brain also dealing with um, emotion. Certain nuclei in the hypothalamus um, are involved and the mammillary nuclei is notable because it also plays a role in memory so if a memory has a very strong emotional sort of component to it um, often the mammillary nuclei will be involved and the emotions that the hypothalamus deals with tend to be um, basic sort of pleasure and pain responses basic sort of responses necessary for survival um, so this is part of the reptilian brain, so even reptiles need to be able to feel pain um, um, or need to feel that they need to get away from something in order to survive and even reptil reptiles need to feel uh, pleasure, need to be able to feel, okay, this is a nice thing to eat, um, this is something I should eat more of, that sort of thing. The thalamus um, doesn't so much play a role in uh, directly in the generation of emotion, but it sends emotional signals uh, to different parts of the brain. So the thalamus is basically a router. It uh, connects to uh, uh, sends signals from one part of the brain to the other. Um, so, for example, if you're feeling an emotion, the thalamus will then send that emotion to your frontal lobe so you can make a decision regarding that emotion. Parts of the frontal cortex are also involved uh, with emotion generation, especially your prefrontal cortex, although the frontal lobe is more, um, um, more involved in decision making, uh, but some um, emotion is also generated in the frontal lobe. Then uh, not only the amygdala, but other parts of the basal ganglia also uh, seem to be involved um, with uh, the generation of uh, emotions. And so there's no one particular structure that's involved with emotion, although if you had to pick one structure that plays probably the biggest role with emotion generation, that would probably be the amygdala. But um, all these structures have a ro uh, their own role to play, uh, and although the amygdala plays a disproportionate part, these other structures will have a role and um, generally your emotional life or emotional being results from the interaction of all these structures that are cascaded throughout the brain. So to make sure you have a good uh, understanding in your mind's eye of what is the limbic system. Limbic system is cingulate gyrus, hippocampus, amygdala. 
So cingulate gyrus you'll most easily see on the mid little view of the brain. It is this round gyrus that sort of hugs the corpus callosum. The cingulate gyrus around about this area is directly connected to the hippocampus. The hippocampus is this worm-like structure um, that is found within the temporal lobe. Hippocampus um, literally means um, under horse or little horse. That is the Greek name for uh, a seahorse. So the anatomists in the 17th century, when they were dissecting the brain, they said, oh, this wriggly thing kind of looks like a seahorse. And um, I think that they were probably high on something or taking some interesting drugs because I don't see how this could at all look like a seahorse. Um, but for uh, but we're kind of stuck with the name now. We call this a seahorse or um, in Greek hippocampus. Immediately anterior to the hippocampus in this region, you'll find uh, a component of the basal ganglia in this region. And this component is the amygdala, which plays a large role in the generation of emotion um, and is involved in almost every emotional process. I'm not going to go deep into how emotion is generated because actually uh, no one knows exactly how emotion works. Um, and it's stupid giving you the latest physiological theories and things and then they're going to be changed in a couple of years time anyway. Suffice to say that um, at the very most basic level of emotional functioning, we can uh, divide emotion into gratification and aversion. And all emotions seem to be basically just shades of these two basic emo emotions. In other words, um, pleasure and hate, basically. Those are two basic emotions, and everything else is really just a reinterpretation of those two basic emotions. So uh, different parts of uh, the limbic system uh, specialize uh, for the, uh, one of the two um, base emotions, either gratification or aversion, uh, and also other structures um, as well that we mentioned in the previous lists. So an ex as an example, the nucleus accumbens, which is uh, in the inferior frontal lobe, um, when that is active, um, there's a st um, strong sense of pleasure and well-being, or rather, strong sense of pleasure and well-being will give you increased activity in the nucleus accumbens. And, uh, for example, um, the use of certain drugs, like heroin, for example, will stimulate the nucleus accumbens, and the person feels really great. And then once that activity in the nucleus accumbens drops off, um, addictive uh, behavior or drug-seeking behavior seems to be driven by the need to get this nucleus accumbens back um, into um, an, an active state because uh, one of the characteristics of, um, uh, of certain drugs is that uh, without the drug nucleus accumbens activity is depressed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the amygdala um, when that is active, it, uh, it tends to be associated with despair and depression. It's, it's more of an aversion center. And um, just to illustrate the point, this is the only region in the brain that will show consistently increased activity when in uh, depressed patients. So the whole, the whole point of depression is that brain activity in general is depressed. The depressed person struggles to concentrate, struggles to think, um, struggles to move around, um, struggles to feel happy. So in general, brain activity is depressed, but that one particular region in the brain actually shows increased activity in um, depression. And in fact, um, this is one of the reasons why antidepressants have to be continued long after symptoms of depression have resolved, usually about 6 to 12 months after symptoms have resolved. Because although the rest of the brain is normal, amygdala overactivity tends to linger on for several months after depression re uh, symptoms have resolved. And you can only stop antidepressants once that amygdala activity has normalized back to baseline, which does take about 6 to 12 months after suppression uh, or after the resolution of depressive symptoms. If a person has brain damage to the amygdala from stroke or brain injury or uh, from a slip of the knife from the neurosurgeon or whatever, um, lesions of the amygdala are associated with um, irrational fearlessness. Uh, so they lo uh, people uh, who lose amygdala, the amygdalas um, 
or have lesions of one of the amygdalas, especially on the right side, which is usually the emotion sort of processing center uh, for most people. Um, lesions here will cause a complete loss of fear uh, to the point of utter stupidity. So you'll jump in front of moving cars or beat up people in front of a police station, um, that sort of thing. Moving on to other structures, um, the prefrontal cortex seems to be more involved with deciding what to do about emotions, um, uh, deciding which emotions to act on, and also controlling expressions over your emotions. So prefrontal cortex, very important for emotions, but uh, they don't so much generate emotions as make decisions about emotions. And if a person has a lesion about prefront in the prefrontal cortex, they'll end up making um, somewhat stupid decisions in the sense that they might become inappropriately emotionally expressive or emotionally inappropriate. They won't be able to suppress inappropriate emotions and they'll also um, end up being unable to decide which emotions to act on and which not to act on. So if they feel enraged at a person, normal person of prefrontal cortex will say, okay, I understand you're feeling enraged, but let's not beat this guy up. That might get us in jail. Whereas if a patient has a prefrontal cortex, that emotional rage might spill over. They might beat up the person because they're unable to um, judge that their emotions will actually get them into trouble and into jail. Um, hypothalamus and amygdala um, are especially involved with generating emotion. We've already mentioned the amygdala is a, it seems to be more with fear and negative emotions. Hypothalamus, also some negative emotions, but also some positive emotions. Um, and then understand that um, emotions can affect the body and the body can affect emotions. So the limbic system receives sensory input uh, from the body and from the special, special senses and that means that we are capable of immediate emotional responses to stimuli even before you know, our frontal lobes are even aware of the stimuli. Um, so we tend to get very emotional about sensory stimuli such as food, our sexual drive. Um, we, tend, uh, we tend to be hardwired to pull up fear very quickly before we've even had a chance to um, to properly think about the situation, which is why sometimes we feel fearful even in really dumb situations where we really shouldn't be fe feeling fear and anxiety, especially when it comes, for example, to meeting new people. Uh, modern civilization uh, is actually a good thing to be able to meet new people in um, uh, in, sort of, uh, in various situations, but a lot of people suffer from social anxiety uh, and fear uh, from um, meeting new people, which makes no context in the, which makes no sense in the context of modern civilization. Of note is that our limbic system is stimulated by novelty, in other words, new situations. So you might have heard the phrase, "A change is as good as a holiday." It's because any change in our lives stimulates our limbic system and um, s makes us basically feel more alive as it were. Whereas um, if we're constantly trapped in a routine, our limbic system um, is not stimulated and we can feel quite bored and unhappy and feel life is meaningless. Which is why some people um, find it um, quite uh, rejuvenating to travel or try a new hobby um, or get a new romantic partner for example. The limbic system also receives input from uh, the parts of our brain that store memory um, and this leads to couplings of memories with emotion um, so that for example when we think of uh, someone we like we remember the positive feelings we have towards them or someone we hate we remember the negative feelings we have towards them. On the other hand also um, if we had a particularly nasty experience at a certain fast food joint, maybe we've got food poisoning after the uh, eating somewhere, um, then, then every time you pass that place you might remember that horrible feeling of nausea and that how, you've, how unhappy you felt after getting the food poisoning, leading you to uh, constantly avoid that place because um, of that sort of emotional reflex you've developed in response to that stimulus.
limbic system then also sends output, so not only receives input, it sends output, and sends output to the hypothalamus and the brainstem. So remember, these are the reptilian brains, the amphibian brains, the ant brains. These are the parts of our body that regulate homeostasis, um, basic reflexes, um, uh, the autonomic systems, the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. So for example, a strong sense of fear might send a signal to our brainstem causing our heart to beat faster um, in response um, or thinking about food or remembering how tasty a chocolate muffin is might actually lead our hypothalamus to stimulate um, hunger um, feelings and uh, food seeking behavior as uh, two random examples. Uh, also of note uh, uh, remember the hypothalamus uh, regulates the endocrine system so your stress hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline might be released uh, if the limbic system is perceiving a lot of stress uh, in your life or having a lot of negative uh, of this overstimulation with negative aversion centers of the limbic system and remember all structures receiving uh, emotional output can give feedback back into the emotional center so the hypothalamus and brainstem can give feedback the frontal lobe can give feedback um, so in that sense for example um, if you're really feeling stressed out and you go for a relaxing massage that massage might calm down um, um, your limbic system um, for example, and um, if you're feeling really worried about something, but you talk yourself through it and say, you know, this isn't really worth worrying about, then the frontal lobe can feed back into the limbic system, calming down your anxiety. So, uh, a lot of anxiety relieving techniques rely on this feedback uh, that is um, available and possible back into the emotional center. So, your actions can actually alter how you feel. And it's interesting because, for example, uh, some uh, small studies have shown that if you force yourself to look happy and smile and act happy, after a while you actually start feeling happy. So um, your feelings will affect how you behave, but how you, be how you behave will also affect um, how you feel. So there's an old uh, English saying, if you can't be happy, at least be merry, and others act happy, and it's true, if you act happy, eventually some, uh, s there will be some stimulation, the positive centers of the limbic system, so you will feel happier, um, uh, even if you weren't feeling happy to begin with. Alright, so, obviously neurons communicate with one another using neurotransmitters, and certain neurotransmitters are more involved with emotion than others, and uh, also have sort of predictable effects regarding emotion. Your big three are your serotonin, dopamine, catecholamines uh, with regards to emotion and all of them are excitatory. So if you have two, uh, if you have enough serotonin you'll feel happy, too little serotonin you'll feel depressed. Dopamine will feel happy if you have enough of it, too, too, too little you'll feel depressed. Adrenaline, you have enough of it, you'll feel happy to live it you'll feel depressed on the other hand if you have too much of any of them then you'll start developing manic symptoms um, so you'll be too happy pathologically happy and uh, depression is thought to usually involve deficiencies of these sort of big threes um, but with depression we don't have any tests available yet to say if a person suffering from serotonin deficiency or dopamine deficiency or adrenaline deficiency um, so when you prescribe them an antidepressant you're basically shooting in the dark because most antidepressants work on only one uh, or two of the three so sometimes it's necessary to switch to different classes of drugs until you find the right neurotransmitter that you need to play around with GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter so uh, any overactivity of GABA is going to lead to depression in the brain. Glutamate is sort of a general purpose excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. It's involved with 75% of all synaptic transmission in the brain uh, in general. And too much glutamate can lead to um, excitatory pro uh, problems in the brain. Uh, it's thought to have some role to play in mania and uh, also explains why some people really like to eat Chinese food because that glutamate in Chinese food can have a bit of a stimulating effect. <coughs>
endorphin from exercise um, inhibits pain and fatigue and pain uh, does um, does have direct feed uh, uh, feeding also direct input into the limbic system so when you're in pain it's not unusual to feel depressed about it so by supp suppressing pain uh, you prevent the uh, um, activation of the aversion centers of the brain and opioids and kephalins also inhibit pain and by that uh, they infect um, the uh, emotional centers in the same way uh, by preventing that stimulation of aversion centers of the limbic system Substance C promotes pain, and when there's pain, uh, pain feeds into the limbic system to st stimulate aversion uh, centers so you feel depressed about feeling the pain. Acetylcholine, um, also excitatory, not so much responsible for emotions per se, but responsible for awakeness. But um, obviously, a disturbance in the acetylcholine levels can spill over into your limbic system. Cholecystokinin inhibits your opiates, um, so it can stimulate pain, which can stimulate your aversion cen centers. Uh, the hormone oxytocin, not really a neurotransmitter, but I thought I'd include it in this list because um, uh, it has a strong role to play in emotional bonding between couples and between mother and child. And uh, if there's any uh, problem with your oxytocin levels in the bloodstream, you're actually going to lose your ability to feel any emotional bond uh, with your partner or with your children. So it plays an important role to play with emotional bonding, although it's not a neurotransmitter per se. So just to share a uh, clinical insight, um, to be happy, uh, the brain must actively generate well-being at those um, uh, positive sort of emotional centers of the brain and one of the things those centers do is they actively suppress the negative centers of the brain so if you've activated a sort of positive uh, emotional center of the brain it will then uh, signals will then be sent to suppress negative uh, centers um, of the brain and this process of actively generating happiness and actively suppressing negative emotions is a high energy use state requires a lot of ATP and requires a lot of neurotransmitters and as such a happy person's brain lights up on a functional MRI scan uh, whereas a depressed or unhappy person's brain tends to be quite dark on a functional MRI scan and just to illustrate the point, um, if you're overly happy, if you have a mania where you engage in irresponsible behavior from sure feelings of happiness, those brain scans tend to show a lot of brain activity, overactivity actually. Um, so the clinical sort of thing that you need to take from that is anything that upregulates brain activity can lead to well-being and or mania. So for example, amphetamines, uh, coffee, um, and other sort of uh, stimulants can increase your feeling of well-being. On the opposite sort of spectrum, sadness is a low energy state. Um, those negative emotional centers of the brain do not use up as much energy as um, positive energy centers or positive emotional centers. Sadness represents therefore the absence of activity in the positive emotional centers of the brain and the absence of that anxiety suppression that was present. Uh, and if you look on a on a brain scan of an anxious or depressed person, they will generally uh, have much less activity, metabolic activity, compared to a person who's happy. So anxiety, even though you think of anxiety as lying awake at night, worrying all the time, that worry is actually using up less energy than uh, feeling happy. So the reason I'm telling you all this, I want you to develop this clinical insight that any condition so any condition that suppresses your brain's metabolic activity, that suppresses this active generation and active suppression, can in fact um, lead to depression or anxiety as a symptom. And a lot of GPs and even specialists are missing this link and they're diagnosing depression when in fact there's a physical problem. So for example, hypothyroidism is probably the most uh, missed clinical condition in a person that presents with depression. Uh, without that thyroid hormone, your marine's metabolic rate is going to drop, you're going to get depressed. Uh, the problem isn't the depression per se, the problem is the thyroid hormone. Treat the thyroid problem, not the depression. 
tryptophan deficiency uh, without tryptophan you're not going to have serotonin you're going to present with depression anemia without those red blood cells you're not going to have oxygen and glucose del being delivered to the brain you're going to have a loss of this ATP production you're going to end up being depressed not bec and the treatment has not antidepressants but to treat the anemia diabetes is a condition of high blood sugar but low tissue sugar and as sugar cannot move from blood into tissue so your brain is actually going to be in a low uh, glucose state it's not going to be able to generate that ATP not going to be able to generate happiness mood disorder or feeling that feeling unhappy or feeling off is often a first sign of uh, diabetes and the iron diagnosed diabetic um, and I seen met too many patients who whose actual physical problems were missed and they were put on antidepressants for the depression when in fact they had a physical uh, health clinical health problem uh, that uh, that would not uh, that requires something else other than antidepressants uh, so don't be an idiot don't be a fool um, always assume that psychiatric symptoms are due to um, uh, not a psychiatric problem but an actual pathophysiological condition until you have decent evidence otherwise and even in low resource settings uh, the very least you can do for a patient is give a very good clinical examination you can always test the urine for um, glucose um, you can always palpate the throat for goiter um, take, uh, if you cannot if you're in a low resource setting and you don't have blood tests and uh, a, a decent workup that you can do at least do a thorough history and thorough clinical um, examination sometimes you'll pick up stuff um, sometimes you can pick up uh, the other day I picked up an anemia in a patient just from the clinical examination as so a private patient elderly patient couldn't afford blood tests but clinically she had anemia so I said well let's treat the anemia uh, on clinical grounds um, since I cannot do any blood tests since you can't afford them and of course if you're going to be working in a better resource setting you need to do some basic blood tests for a person that presents with depression first time um, such as a thyroid test uh, and a hemoglobin and a finger prick blood glucose as a very basic screening of um, common conditions that lead to depression it's okay if you miss the uncommon conditions that lead to depression but please at least as a, on GP level at least be aware of the common causes at least look for those common causes because there are too many patients walking around there with undiagnosed hypothyroidism undiagnosed anemia etc etc and one uh, and one condition strangely enough that I found that commonly presents with uh, depression uh, and tiredness is a uh, vitamin D deficiency um, possibly due to calcium dysregulation in the brain so there's inability to send those um, um, action potentials from neuron to neuron um, and strangely enough even in this country with all the sunshine there's quite a few people walking around vitamin D deficiency so that's also something that um, uh, I've been picking up in some patients that have been hopping from GP to GP um, and have not been able to get the diagnosis and then I find out they're actually vitamin D deficient treat them with vitamin D and a month or two later it's like they have a new lease on life so please um, always think outside of the box with psychiatric conditions especially on first presentation or, and sometimes even psychiatric patients develop clinical conditions um, I remember one case in Mama Lodi Hospital where a patient was uh, a schizophrenic patient was admitted with acute psychosis the doctor admitting him didn't bother examining him and didn't even bother touching him um, next morning on ward rounds um, I saw this patient was not looking well feet having temperature spikes 39 degrees I examined the patient he actually had pneumonia so the problem with this patient yes he had he had schizophrenia but the reason why he was acting strangely is because he was going delirious from a severe pneumonia so remember even psychiatric patients can develop clinical um, other clinical disease states so don't be a fool think out the side think outside of the box